on. Hi, guys. Um, welcome back to another week of enrichment class. So this is my good friend, Liam Keller. Uh, Liam, why don't you start us off and tell us a little bit, a, a little bit about you. Absolutely. Uh, so my name is Liam Keller. I am first and foremost a bass player, but I play at this point about 27 different instruments because I get bored and like to learn new instruments. Uh, I am the orchestra director for the school district of the Chathams. So I know a lot of you are in Morris County and a little bit north. I'm on the southern edge of that in Chatham. Uh, I teach two high school orchestras, high school music theory, high school piano, and I also do fourth and fifth grade orchestra at one of the elementary schools in town. Um, in addition to that, I lead a pretty active uh, performing career. Uh, I've been performing for about, God, how old am I? 13 years now. I had my first performance in New York City when I was 12. Um, I do jazz. I do classical. I do a lot of musicals. I've had a chance to play on Broadway. Um, I've had a chance to do national tours of different musicals, things like that. And, you know, I just, I love music. I'm happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Well, thank you. Thank you for spending your Tuesday evening with us. So Liam, a lot of us are, and I see in the room, either violinists, violists, or cellists, but I don't see any uh, bass players in here. Can you maybe uh, tell us maybe why that might be? Absolutely. Uh, so first of all, you don't see any bass players in here yet. My goal is to get at least three of you to play bass after this. Uh, bass is one of the most fun instruments to play. Uh, that being said, I do have, I won't lie, for all you violinists, I do have my violin right here. I was playing earlier today. I am, I will never profess to be a good violin player, but I really enjoy playing it. Um, bass has always, has was my first instrument that I ever learned how to play. Um, back when I was in third grade is when we chose instruments, I'm sure like many of you, and you had the high schoolers come around and show you the instruments, right? So that's what they did. I grew up in Westfield. That's what they did in Westfield. And I remember that one of the high schoolers had a bass and it was bright blue. Now, when I say bright blue, like you see those little three dots in the top right corner of your thing, that color. And it was made of metal. And it was the most absurd thing I've ever seen in my life. But, you know, third grade me who was eight years old was like, that's the absolute coolest thing I've ever seen in my life and wanted nothing more than to play the bass. Um, now, as many of you know, there aren't that many bass players in an orchestra, especially in youth orchestras. You don't see a whole lot of them. Um, and I was told, I that year, was, there were a lot of bass players that signed up. I think out of, I don't know, probably about 100 people, we had about nine bass players sign up to play the bass that year. Uh, the problem was they only had eight basses, eight school basses for us to use. And I was the odd man out. They gave the bases to eight other people and they did not give one to me. And what they said to me was, well, you can either go find one yourself to play or you can play the French horn. And I, being the stubborn person I was and well, still kind of am, um, I demanded to play the bass. And my mom, who was a wonderful person, searched high and low and found a bass for me in my size. It was an eighth size bass, which is essentially just a slightly larger cello. Um, she found me a bass in New York City and was able to get it for me. And after one year, I was the only bass player left um, and really never looked back. I've been playing bass ever since then. So I've been playing for about 18 years now. Um, I love the bass and I went from the big upright uh, bass that you see in orchestras. I play electric bass as well. Um, that's a fun one. That's in the other room as well. Um, one thing that you're going to realize as you get older and become more of a musician is you get something called gear acquisition syndrome where you just see instruments and you're just like, yes, you know what? I'm going to spend the money that I don't need to spend on that instrument right there that I may play once a year. It's a lot of fun. And then you can get you can actually fill up an entire apartment or a house with instruments. I have a room in my parents' house in Westfield still that is just filled with instruments that I haven't played in years, uh, but I won't let them get rid of it because, you know, you never know when you want to play the accordion again. Um, but it's, it's fun. I, you've all seen a bass, so you know how large they can be. I currently own six of them, which is too many, as I'm told every single day. 
Um, but it's, it's really cool because they all do different things. Just like we all have different clothes for different seasons. I have different bases for different types of music I play. I have a jazz bass. I have an orchestra bass. I have a solo bass. I have a bass that I play outside when it's really gross out because I don't want my good basses to get bad. Um, and then I have my bows as well. I have four different bows that I play. This is currently my favorite bass, my favorite bass, my favorite bow. Um, it's pretty cool. I don't know if you can see it. I have salt and pepper hair, so half black hair, half white hair. Uh, this bow was made in the early 1930s in uh, Germany. I think this is the German one. Yep, this is the German one. Um, but yeah, I, I have a very, as you can see, I have a fascination with kind of instruments and just learning more about them and obtaining them. So I've, I've gotten quite a few bases over the years and it's fun because you get to be one of the only people that plays a really cool instrument. Um, you'll be many times in your life in a room of musicians and out of that, maybe one person will be a bass player, maybe. But it's really cool because you'll meet a bass player and you'll see somebody and you'll be like, that person's a bass player. I don't even need to talk to them. I know they're a bass player. Liam, could you tell us um, the difference between a violin a bass or a cello and a bass? Like, could you show us what the difference might be? Yeah, absolutely. Give me two seconds. Let me grab all my instruments. So I'm going to talk as I'm grabbing them. So the violin, as we know, is the highest si sounding instrument in the string family. Uh, here's mine right here. This is a nice little violin I've had for years. Um, I don't know much about it. Just a factory violin, but it's fun. I like to play it. Um, I like to play it very poorly and very out of tune, but it's fun to play. Um, and it's the highest sounding instrument in the family. Uh, let's see, Is the bow right here for it. Please don't critique my technique. I know it's bad. I haven't played it. Yes, I know I didn't use fourth fingers. I know I always tell my kids to use fourth fingers. I'm sorry, I'm a bad violin player. Um, and then we have a viola, which I don't currently have because I don't know where I put it. Don't tell anybody I lost my viola. Um, that's not an indictment on the viola. I do love the viola. I think it gets a lot of unnecessary hate, but I may have lost it in the process of moving it between places. Um, the viola is the second highest sounding instrument in the orchestral family. And then we have the cello, which I just hit on my chair. And I want you to know that my viola, like my two viola students in this were just like, when you were like, oh, I lost my viola, they both did like a face palm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will tell you, um, I was actually given something very cool this year by a couple of the parents of students that I teach. I was gifted a five string violin viola hybrid. So I no longer have to have both. I can just use one, which is wonderful. For those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, it is a violin with a low C string, which is really, really nice to have because then I don't have to constantly be picking up different instruments as I go to demonstrate things. Um, I wish they would make like a hybrid cello slash bass so I didn't have to keep picking those up, but that doesn't happen. So then, yes, I know it is very sacrilegious. I'm aware. Um, so then we have our cello, which is our second to lowest uh, instrument in the family. Let me get a little bit higher. Don't use vibrato on scales, kids. It's just to hide my bad intonation. And then we have the bass, which give me one second, I have to pick it up. So this is one of my basses. This is the bass that I call it my workhorse bass because it does everything. Um, it's a really, really nice instrument. It was made in the early 1970s, actually in America. I have a bass from, I have two basses from America one from Germany, one from Italy, and one from France. Um, my Italian bass is 200 years old, uh, right around there, maybe a little younger. Um, but it's really cool. 
This is my American base. Also, if you might be able to see it as something interesting up here, which we can talk about afterwards. But our bass is the lowest instrument in the string family. Sounds a little bit like this, and it has not been tuned. And it goes down there, but mine goes a little bit lower. So that is the bass, which is by far the coolest string instrument. That is not up for discussion. I will die on that hill. It is the coolest string instrument and one of the most fun to play. Um, and I have, you know, I really, I really do love the bass. It's, it's something that's given me a lot of very cool opportunities in life. Uh, things that I wouldn't have had a chance to do other if I didn't play such more, such a unique instrument that not a lot of people played. Could you tell us the difference between the strings, like the string name? Yeah, all that good absolutely. Stuff? So, does anybody here know which string instrument has the strings most similar to the bass? Lorelei. I'm pretty sure it's cello. It's cello, that's interesting. That's what a lot of people think. What if I told you it was the violin? So, Violin, strings lowest to highest. G, D, A, E. Cello and viola, C, G, D, A, lowest to highest. The bass has strings that are exactly opposite the violin. So if the violin goes G, D, A, E, the bass goes E, a, D, G. Yeah, E, A, D, G. So the bass also has something very unique. How many people here know anything about music theory? Anything about intervals, anything like that? So the bass is the only instrument. The bass is tuned differently than all of the other string instruments. The other string instruments, are tuned in fifths. So G, A, B, C, D, and so on and so forth. C, D, E, F, G. The bass is tuned in fourths. Goes E, A, D, G. It's the only instrument in the string family, in the orchestral string family, that is tuned in fourths. Sometimes. That's mainly in America. There is a school of thought in Europe and there are some bass players that actually tune their basses in fifths. And it's really hard to play, and it hurts my brain when I try to do it, so I don't do it. I just keep it in fourths. Can you tell us what the finger pattern is like? Because the finger pattern must be a lot wider, unlike violin or viola, where it's like one and two touch. Your, yep. Do your fingers ever touch like that? No, my fingers haven't touched yet. Now, so on a base, on the base, there's one big thing that we don't do. We don't use our third finger. So we skip our third finger entirely. We use first, second, and fourth. Now, for violin, from E to F sharp, you use one to high two, right? You still use one to two. On a bass, to play E to F sharp, we use one to four. So we go first finger to fourth finger. So, you know how you can play a scale in entirely one hand position on the violin, viola, or even cello? Can't do that on the bass. We shift, and we shift pretty quickly. So, just for the regular D major scale, open, one, four, Open, one, four, shift, two, four. So, I know I just told you we don't use third, oh, we don't use third finger. It's kind of a lie. We don't use third finger much in orchestral music, but we use it a lot in solo music. Once we get to what's called thumb position, 
which is when you get an octave higher than your open string, we start to use first, or we start to use thumb, first finger, second finger, and third finger, and then we stop using our fourth finger. So our bass finger patterns change a lot. We have to use our brains a lot, which can be tricky, but it's, as we all know, once we get those fingers, finger patterns down, it gets a whole lot easier and you can stop, kind of turn your brain off a little bit as you're playing. I know thumb position is uh, kind of new to some of our students, especially our violinists. You know, they've never heard about thumb position mm -hmm. before. Um, do you have like a thumb callus to help you? Does that hurt the side of your thumb? Yeah, so when you first start playing in thumb position, it really, really hurts. You ever gotten, you ever gotten stung by a bee? It's like when you get stung by a bee for the first time and you're like, oh, that was mildly unpleasant. And then it kind of goes away after a little bit. It's exactly what happens here. Or like when you were first learning to hold a bow and your teacher kept telling you to curve your thumb and you're like, no, I want to put my thumb down here or I want to put my thumb straight. And your thumb started to cramp up. It's kind of what happens with your thumb position thumb. But then you play for it for like a play with it like that for like a week. And then you get what's called a callus, just like all of us get on our uh, fingers uh, on our left hand. And then you really stop feeling it. I actually, it was kind of funny. It was kind of gross as well, but I had a callus on my thumb once so big that I actually cut it when I was cooking dinner and I had no idea because I couldn't feel it. Oh, that's really gross. Yeah. <laughs> um, Somebody had a really good question, and it was, um, I think Sephora had this question. She asked me earlier, she was like, is it a pain to carry a giant instrument everywhere? Like, how, yeah. do, you, how do you carry that everywhere? Like, what is, what is so, the protocol? It is, I won't say it's a pain. It's very, they're really not very heavy, but they're very awkward to carry. Um, it's like carrying a dog. Your dog isn't that heavy, but there's no great way to carry it because they're wiggling around and they really don't want to be held. It's kind of the same thing with the bass. Like, they're big. They don't want to be carried. Um, I don't know. I may have met some of you at some of the prior concerts. I probably have. Um, I'm not a big person. I am five foot eight on a good day if I got a really good stretch that morning. Um, I'm not a big person, but it's really not hard to carry the bass. My bass probably only weighs... I don't know, about eight pounds, if that. Um, it's just really hard to kind of figure out where it is when you're carrying it. Because um, I'm always, you know, I'm sure a lot of, a few of you are tall or have tall relatives where they're always ducking as they walk through doorways so they don't bash their head into the wall. It's kind of the same thing we have to do with the base is you always have to kind of see where the top of it is. That way you don't like bash your base's face into a wall. Don't you guys have like wheels for your instruments? Yes, so we do have wheels. Um, and there are two types of wheels on basses. There's the type of wheel that I have, which is called the bass buggy, which is really fun. Oh, I don't even know where it is, doesn't matter. Um, it has two wheels and it attaches to the bottom of the bass. And then there's like a rubber strap around the top of it that attaches to itself and you just kind of lean the bass and push it. Uh, that's the type of wheel that I have. They also make wheels that actually go where the end pin goes. So you take the end pin out of the instrument and you slide a wheel back up in there um, and you tighten it and you can use that. Um, and those are the two types of wheels that we have to use. I like my bass buggy because I can use it pretty quickly and I don't have to worry about moving the end pin in and out. Don't want to hurt my bass. So I've seen in, in many concerts, sometimes the bass players standing and sometimes the bass player is sitting like on a very tall bench. Yep. Can you tell us the difference between those two? Absolutely. Um, so I, it's funny. It's one of those things where it's kind of like tying shoes. Some people learn it like you make one loop and you loop it around and then you pull it together. Some learn like two bunny ears and you twist them and tie. It, it really all comes down to who your teacher was and what you find is most comfortable. Um, I'm somebody who like I said, I'm short. I don't want to be any shorter next to a really tall instrument. So I like to stand when I play. I find I have more control over the instrument when I'm standing and I can move a little bit more. Um, although 
when I'm lazy or when I'm really tired and it's been a long day, I will play on a stool. Um, but it, it's one of those things where it's a personal preference. If you're more comfortable sitting on a stool and playing, nothing wrong with it. If you like standing instead, totally acceptable as well. Could you give us a mini concert? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to play two pieces for you. One of them's a pop piece that you'll probably know, which I'm hoping I'll be able to see on my computer. Um, and the other one is an orchestral piece, which a couple of you may know. It's by a pretty famous composer and actually sounds like a nursery rhyme you've heard before. I'm so excited because I think I know what it is. <laughs> one, which I'm sure many of you could probably figure out what it was. Uh, and here's the second one, which wait, I'll be very impressed. Wait, wait, Liam, I have a really important question. Yes. Do you think um, Princess, uh, uh, pr uh, Princess Elsa, do you think Elsa would still be able to freeze everything if her melody was in the bass line instead of a, instead of a treble line? Ooh, that's a good question. I'm going to say yes. I think definitely. Although I think maybe the ice would have started cracking with some of the low notes, but you know, who's to know? So as you saw for both of those, the bass can stay in a super duper low register, but also play in a more high melodic register as well. I have a question for, for the kids in here. Yes. Who can tell me where that piece is from? Where, where that piece, William, you're so close. It's actually very not Mahler. Close. Very close. It's actually not Mahler 5, but you're very close. Not Mahler 9. You're very close there. You have the right composer. It is who Mahler. Tell, it is Mahler, yes. Um, but who can also tell me what that melody is, if they recognize it? It's very, very similar. It's just in a kind of sort of different key. Anybody? Arjun, is that a hand raise? No? William, you want to take another stab at it? I, I love that you knew it was Mahler. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. It's not no, eight. No, it's not eight. <laughs> I'll give you a hit. It's his first symphony. Yep. Third movement of Mahler, the first Yeah. Symphony. So it's Mahler one. Yeah, but you know, extra bonus points for you, William, for actually getting knowing that that was a Mahler piece. 
And for those of you <laughs> that have listened to Mahler, it sounds a lot like Mahler. Yes. Anybody, can anybody tell us where that melody is? What does it sound like? It's all a song that I know you guys have played before, either with me in prelude class or you've, you've heard it before, definitely. It's just minor instead of major. Anyone? Abigail, Anna, really? Frere Jaca, Frere Jaca, dormez-vous. Yes, do you guys know that one? Some of you guys are nodding your head. <laughs> so it's the same thing, but it's minor. So it's like a sad version of it. <laughs> um, yeah, so you guys are saying, well, you, you guys know it. Uh, there was actually a really good question somebody asked. Uh, uh, my cellist, I know it's not Tuja, but um, Elijah. Elijah asked, how do you tune such a low instrument? It's a really good question. Um, so all of you have fine tuners on your instruments, right? Basses don't have fine tuners. We have pegs and only pegs, but our pegs tune the same amount as what your fine tuners do. Um, I'll kind of pull my bass into frame for a second so you can see my tuners. Um, there's actually something really interesting about this bass and really kind of ornate that not a lot of people know. Can you see my tuners? Kind of look like hearts. Now, can anybody tell me what they look like they're made of? Lorley. Uh brass, I think. That's a really good guess. They're actually made of gold. Uh, so th this instrument is really, really interesting. Uh, it was owned by a pretty, pretty well-known bass player um, out of Chicago originally. And he decided that he was going to make the fine tuners themselves, the actual pegs on the instrument, made out of 18 karat gold. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of why I found this bass really cool. They're carved into hearts. Uh, they were able to carve them into hearts. And what we do, just like you use your fine tuners, lefty loosey, righty tighty. Um, actually, ours is a little different. Uh, we turn ours to the left to make it tighter or away from us to make the pitch go higher. And we turn it to the right or closer to us to make it go lower. Um, and what we do is we tune, uh, you know how for your instruments, you play two strings at once to hear what they sound like and try to tune to the interval. We do something similar on the bass, but instead of playing two strings at once, we play our harmonics to see, uh, to see what they sound like together. So, and if you can hear any bit of a wobble, that means it's out of tune. And I haven't tuned this in a couple days, but it's okay. It's got a little bit of a wobble. So you tune the highest string, to the next highest string, and you listen for those harmonics together to see if it makes kind of like that alien of abduction, like woo -woo 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 sound. It's what you're really trying to avoid. And it's nice because especially when you're in a concert, you can do it quickly and quietly, um, and nobody's gonna know whether or not you're out of tune because you'll be able to check pretty quickly. Somebody asked, or uh, Lorley asked, um, are they solid gold or plated? They are solid gold. So they are solid gold on here. They are not 24 karat gold, would have been nice, um, but they are 18 karat gold and they're pretty cool. Um, but the, the, there are like little gears that are on them and those are made of brass. Very cool. All right, so let's start um, the interview part of the question. We sure. will ask you our favorite question first, which is, are you ready? It's the most important question you'll ever get asked in an interview. What would you do if you found a penguin in your freezer? Take the penguin out of the freezer. I want a penguin as a pet. He can't be my pet if he's in a freezer. He can just hang out with me while I'm practicing. Maybe I'll have somebody that can, like, he can play the violin while I'm playing the bass and we can create our own little animal duet. Can, can you imagine, like, a, like a zoo orchestra? A zorchestra. Zorchestra. Million dollar concept right there. <laughs> Teach zoo animals how to play instruments. Best thing That's ever. That's what we need to do. 
Um, how often do you practice and versus, well, I guess I can ask you, I'm going to ask you this two different ways. How often do you practice now versus how often do you practice when you were maybe younger or during your prime? Sure. And I hate to think about it, but I am kind of past my prime at this point. Um, but I, right now I, I don't practice as much as I should. Um, I try to practice um, every day while I'm teaching. So that's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I normally take the weekends off. Um, and I practice in between classes. I'll practice early in the morning. I get to school pretty early and I'll just take my bass out and kind of warm up with some scales, go through some exercises. So I'd say probably when all said and done about an hour a day, uh, most of it being while I'm at school. When I was in my prime, I was practicing between six and seven hours a day. Um, it was, it was a lot. It was a lot. Um, that was mainly in college. Um, and I was practicing between six and seven hours a day. My schedule in college was wake up at 5 a.m., go to the music building, which was about 10 minutes away from my uh, house. Uh, I was at the music building from about 5.15 to about 8.15, so three hours in the morning. Then I'd uh, go back. My first class would be at nine. I'd have classes until right about 12. I'd practice from 12 to about one. I'd have class from one to about three, rehearsal from... 3.15, 3.30 to about 5.30. I'd go home and eat dinner, do a little bit of my homework, go back to the music building around 7, practice from 7 to about 10, and then call it a day, um, and then do it all again the next day. And it's fun. Um, and it's really interesting. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you think, oh my God, how could anybody ever have enough music to practice for that many hours a day that often? Um, bass is one of those instruments where especially for orchestral instruments, people think that you can just play classical music with string instruments, but that's not true. You can do really whatever you want with string instruments. And basses are really, really versatile. They do a lot of different things. So when I was in college, I was in the band, I was in the orchestra, I was in the jazz band, I was practicing solo music, I was helping out with the musicals in the theater department, um, I was accompanying singers. So I always had different things to practice. So my practice sessions were never boring or stale. Uh, Laura Lee wanted to know uh, which Broadway shows you've played in. So I've gotten a chance to do a show called, um, oh my God, I'm blanking on the name of it now. I just did it two years ago in Ohio. <sighs> Songs from a New World, musical by Jason Robert Brown. Um, I actually, I've done 52 different shows at this point that are on my resume. Um, I've done everything from Lion King to, um, I got to do Book of Mormon a couple years ago. Um, I've done Susical, I've done Shrek, I've done Godspell, I've done pretty much any and every musical you've ever heard of, I've played at some point. Uh, Anna and Abigail want to know, what is your favorite orchestral piece? I'm going to give you two answers. I'm going to give you my favorite orchestral piece right now, that I'm listening to, and then I'm gonna give you my favorite of all time, and that's gonna be two. Um, my favorite right now is the second movement of Shostakovich 10. Um, I think it is just a disgusting display of what string instruments can do when they get really, really angry at, a, at what's happening. Uh, if you've never seen anybody play Shosty 10, watch it, it's absurd. There's a, there's a version of Bernstein conducting, I think it was, um, might have been the LSO, or might have been Gartenberg, um, and it was absurdly good. It was amazing, um, and you should just watch their in, their articulations and their bow speed and how they're matching it up perfectly. It's amazing to watch. Um, my two favorite pieces. I'm going to give you three favorite pieces because I can never choose because that's what instrumentalists do is we can never pick a favorite piece. Um, if I want to listen to something slow and kind of sad. I'll be listening to Samuel Barber's Adagio for Strings. Um, I love that piece of music. I think it's timeless. Um, if I want to listen to something that's really going to kind of amp me up and get me ready to go, I'll listen to um, Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet, not Prokofiev's, because Prokofiev's makes me sad. Um, but I love Tchaikovsky, Tchaikovsky's version. And then if I want something that's just like the best thing to ever listen to, and quite possibly one of the best symphonies ever written, it's Dvorak 9. I mean, you just... You can't beat it. Uh, the New World Symphony is just a tour de force from beginning to end and is fun as can be to play. I think it's actually the symphony I've played the most in my life. I've played it like 
11 times and it never gets old. I've had the honor playing Dvorak 9 with you. And I want yep. you to know, I just saw William just jump out of his ch chair <laughs> and like <laughs> cheer for you for Dvorak 9. And then just, I saw him like singing it. I was like, yes. <laughs> it's, yeah. And if you can find, there's a version of Dudamel doing it with Berlin online. And I think it's just the fourth movement. Oh, it's awesome. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. And I, I do that like twice a week. I remember I've done Shashti 10, like I've done Shostakovich 10, and I remember leaving rehearsal basically delirious because I yeah. was so exhausted. Yeah, like there is, there's no breaks in that piece at all. And you get to the end and everybody just kind of looks around and it's like one of those things where it's like, you ever seen a horror movie where everybody's always like looking around and being like, oh my God, what's coming out next? That's what you feel like as a string player playing Shostakovich. It's just like, oh my God, where's he going to attack me from next? It's nuts. So much fun. All right. So I have a lot of people asking me to ask you our next favorite question, which is, would you rather fight one horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses? Oh, God. Horse-sized duck. I'm going to go with one horse-sized duck. I'm not a big guy, but I feel like I could land a couple good blows on a horse-sized horse duck, especially because they don't have, like, hands. I feel like I can just like outreach them, just start swinging. Horses kick, and I don't have a long reach, and I feel like their legs are still going to be long enough that they're going to kick me in the face. So I'm going to go with final answer, one duck-sized, wait, one horse-sized duck. That has been the uh, average answer so far. Like, that's the reigning answer. Yeah. I it, think only one person has chosen the other one. Horses, horses are mean. I don't, I don't mess with horses. Yeah, they are, they are a little uh, tricky. So this, this crowd of kids are big fans of two set. And so they just want to know what your thoughts are on it. Uh, I love two set. Um, actually in my orchestral classes from fourth and fifth grade up to high school, we have what's called two set Tuesdays, where as long as we get to rehearse in class and get everything we need to get done, done we watched that week's newest two set video together um and it's always a lot of fun i think i think they do a lot of good they're really good players um they really make me laugh and i think it's really important to show how much fun playing a string instrument can be um i'm sure all of you saw the episode a couple of my favorites are when they try to learn a different instrument in an hour um the the bass episode cracks me up because the entire time they're just complaining that their hands hurt um, and that's what I sound like when I'm playing the violin. I'm like, I don't want to use a fourth finger. Leave me alone. I don't want to do that. Just let me play open strings for once. Can I just say, because I, I know that you guys asked, um, we had one person who was not a string player do this interview, and he was a horn player. And he he's never really heard of two set before. So after this whole session, you know, him and I were on the phone together, and I was like, here, I'm going to send you some two set videos. And it was you said playing French horn and yep. he's just on the phone like dying hysterically <laughs> it's it's just so much fun to watch um I'm really waiting for the Sibelius drop when they get three million um I love listening to Sibelius um I have to say I have a very fond I love watching one specific violinist play and that is uh Hilary Hahn she is my absolute all-time favorite um, I think she's fantastic, and her version of Sibelius is wonderful, and it's just, yeah. I think that's a great way to lead us into our next question, which is, who is your favorite composer? Oh, that's not fair. Um, it's Mahler. It, it's it's Mahler. Um, it will be and always will be Mahler. Um, I think his symphonies are unrivaled. Um, his Resurrection Symphony, I consider to be the greatest piece of music ever written. Um, I, I love Mahler. Like, I, I have an unhealthy obsession with Mahler as a composer. Um, but I also do really like Tchaikovsky. So that's really hard. But I'm gonna, I'm, I think final answer is Mahler. That's a great answer. Uh, you're actually the second person to say that too of all of these little uh, I keep wanting to call these podcasts or like YouTube videos <laughs> but they are neither of those things like I think I'm cool but I'm not <laughs> as all like everybody will tell you like mm, we're like Lakeland cool but not like YouTube cool <laughs> <laughs> um let's see 
guys, this is this is your time. It's the last 15 minutes. Go ahead and put in your questions. Anna and Abigail want to know what is your second favorite instrument? Assuming that bass is your first, I guess. But it, I, bass I just, is my first favorite instrument, but I have like a love-hate relationship with it because it never does what I want it to do. Like I always just want to have the melody and I never get the melody unless I'm playing Mahler um, or Beethoven sometimes, but he's mean with the melodies for the bass. Um, second favorite instrument. This might be controversial. I really love the bassoon. I think the bassoon is a super cool instrument. Um, and I don't think it just sounds like dying ducks, which a lot of people do. I think it's a really cool instrument that is really tough to play. Uh, that and oboe, um, are really, really cool instruments in the wind family. I would say second favorite string instrument is the cello, just because of how versatile it is. Um, I, I think it's really interesting. I've been trying to teach myself, um, oh God, what's it called? The famous cello, the Elgar Cello Concerto. It's going really poorly, but I'm doing my best. Um, it's, I love that piece of music and I really want to learn it. Um, I see the next question is, what is my favorite food? Sushi. Absolutely sushi. I could eat sushi every day, all day, without fail, um, followed closely by chicken wings. And Have then, you been to Kenko, though? No. Where's that? Oh, I need to. It's the best sushi. Voted best sushi in New Jersey. Got to take you there, Liam. Yeah. 100% down. Okay. Uh, Ariel wants to know, what is your favorite uh, animal and ice cream flavor. I have two favorite animals. One is a, one is of the flying variety and one is of the tree climbing variety. Uh, I think owls are really neat. I don't know why. I've always thought owls are just super cool creatures. Like who doesn't want to be able to like turn their head 360 like a crazy person. That'd be awesome. Um, and then koalas. I also think koalas are really cool. Um, I went to school in Ohio for college, uh, right near a pretty famous zoo. And I got a chance to hold a koala while I was in college. And that was maybe the highlight of my life. Um, like including music highlights. Like I think holding a koala may have been the coolest thing I've ever done. Um, yeah. Somebody, uh, oh, Anna and Abigail asked, if you weren't a musician, what would you do? Archaeology been fascinated with archaeology either that or a lawyer but I I couldn't do that everybody in my family is either like a lawyer or an engineer and not for me but archaeologist like Indiana Jones style yeah big time yeah big time I want to like swing through trees and like fight mummies that after I steal their like precious jewels from their temple 100% um, I, I think it's just a super cool profession and I've always been a big history buff um, and unlocking like the keys to history, I think is super cool to me. Okay. I have a tricky question for you to answer. Okay. What are some ways you work on tricky rhythm passages? I am a firm believer in clapping and counting. Um, bass players, I think you'll notice more than almost anybody in the orchestra are very secure in their rhythms. It's because like I said before, we don't get melodies a whole lot. A lot of what we do is keeping the beat so that when the violins are just shredding in like fifth position, um, you can you have like some steady beat to hold on to. Um, I clap and count all of my rhythms um, just to kind of get that feel in my hands of where the beat is. And then I also count it just so I can get a verbal cue of what number the beat is, where the beat falls. Um, I also love singing, so I'll sing my part um, just so I can kind of hear where everything's falling in line. Um, and yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of how I go about it. Clapping and counting is my biggest one that I think benefits every single person that could play because you'll be able to feel the rhythm in your hands. So when you transition to this or to pizzicato or this, um, everything just becomes much more natural. Um, and you'll also be able to subdivide in your head as you're going, oh yeah, subdivide, please subdivide, always subdivide. Don't count big beats, count small beats. Can you give us your best dog bark? Woof! <laughs> excellent. Beautiful. Excellent. <laughs> uh, what is your favorite ice cream flavor? Oh, God, favorite? I, I'm really boring. Um, vanilla, I'm really boring with ice cream. But I do make my own ice cream. 
Um, so I actually, for those of you that have, go to like Dairy Queen or like Magic Fountain and Summit, I make my own blizzards. So I just made blizzards the other day with like M&Ms and peanut butter cups in it with vanilla ice cream and a little bit of maple syrup. So like I make up for like the boring flavor with like a lot of like mix-ins. So a lot of my kids live by like Parsippany or like by where I live and yep. we don't go to Magic Fountain. We are hardcore Denville Dairy fans. Have you been to Denville Dairy? I have years ago, years ago. Um, but yeah, I, I have definitely been there. It's very good. I just go, All right. Magic Fountain's tough because it's like on my way to work. Like it's right in between work and home. So like if it's a bad day, I'll just like get ice cream at, I don't know, 2 p.m. That's a fair, that's fair. Everybody can have a little bit of ice cream to cheer themselves up. Oh, Rhea, you got to go to Denville Dairy now. <laughs> you got to ask mom and dad. It's summertime. It's time for ice cream. Tell them, tell them Miss Sue sent you. <laughs> um, all right, guys, any last questions? Anybody else? I have one last question for you because it is summertime. Yep. And it is either really, really hot or we've been trapped inside and we want to do something. So how do you motivate your self to practice um that's tough that's really tough because i'm firmly in the feeling right now of i don't want to do anything ever again i just want to sit down and relax but practicing is super important um and it sounds crazy but i will watch like nine-year-olds that are better than me and just be like oh my god what am i doing i can do that and then i'll just sit down and just practice through it until I can make it sound competent. Um, there's a, there's a bass player and I've been listening to her for about 10 years now. Her name's Mick Young Sung. Uh, she's Korean and she is one of the most incredible bass players I've ever heard in my life. Um, so she posts every couple of days, um, different solos that she's working on and kind of her progress and what she's doing. And I kind of follow along with that and that'll be what I practice. Um, I'm also a big believer in listening to new music. Um, so I will just listen to music and try by ear to pick out uh, the bass line and play along with that. That's how I practice kind of my ear training and things like that. So I like to just really vary what my practice is because I know a lot of us just practice solo stuff or just practice etudes and things like that. And I just, I get, I have really bad ADHD, so I can't just focus on one thing for all like my whole practice session. So I move around to like different areas of music. So the next few questions are gonna be speed round questions and then we'll wrap it up. So speed round, ready? Yep. Favorite color? Uh, yellow. Apple or Android? Apple. <laughs> What's your favorite sport? Uh, God, golf or football. Uh, do you love chocolate or coffee? Coffee in the morning, that's a lie. Chocolate and coffee. Um, okay. <laughs> your opinion on swimming? No problem with it. I enjoy swimming on a hot day. And then our last question, would you rather eat onions or garlic for the rest of your life? Onions. I have an onion a day. It keeps the doctor away. <laughs> Thank you so much, Liam, for joining us. I hope you guys learned something about base. Um, next week, we're going to learn something about the viola. Nice. Fancy. I know my violas are like, yeah. Be nice yeah. to the violas. Viola is a super cool instrument that doesn't deserve all the hate it gets. It's a great that, instrument. It is very true. We're also going to talk a little, about, a little bit about composition. Ooh, love that. Yeah. So join us again next week, and I will see you all again soon. Thank you again, Liam. Thanks for having me. Bye, guys.